Welcome! You are listening to Audio from the Table. If you'd like to learn more about our community or donate to this ministry, please visit thetabletx.com. Grace and Peace Table Podcast listeners, Brett here. So glad to be with you all. We are in week three, part three in our series titled The Bible Doesn't Say That. There's uh, all sorts of bumper sticker theological ideas floating around both in and outside the church. And, uh, you know, they, I mean, some of them are okay. Some are just downright terrible, but people think they're in the Bible, that they're a direct quote from the Bible, just because they kind of sound biblical in some way. Um, when, uh, you know, in actuality, they're not. So what we've been doing in this series is kind of unpacking a few of these phrases, looking at them, trying to name the good, the bad, mostly the bad, um, and kind of just reflect on them together. So um, the one we're dealing with this week in the title of the message is love the sinner, hate the sin. <laughs> oh, babies, <laughs> it's another juicy one. And it is, uh, it's ripe for the picking, mostly because of... Um, the really problematic ways it's been deployed in the church, not exclusively, but especially uh, against um, LGBTQ folks in um, just really painful ways. And um, it, at least it feels like with every year that goes by, it's more and more used almost exclusively um, towards them. But um, where I actually want to begin with this statement is to kind of ask you to like go back to the days before you had ever heard this phrase. Um, And if you can't remember that time, just kind of imagine what it would be like, like rewind history a bit. Let's, let's just pretend we've, we've never heard this, this new theological saying before. And suddenly someone, you know, in a sermon or whatever, they, they say, we've got to learn to love the sinner and hate the sin. Now, what I want to name is I, I do think it, it has something going for it in the sense of, um, I mean, a, it's super catchy, <laughs> like astoundingly memorable. Once you, like you've heard it once, you'll never forget it. Never. Like it's just, it's so poetic, you know, <laughs> love the sinner, hate the sin. It just, it's, it's extremely catchy. Um, and even thinking of just like, it's kind of how you imagine it could be used, especially in relation to oneself. Um, like I could imagine, for example, um, it definitely there's times when I've done something just incredibly stupid and, and wrong, you know, and I fear in my bones, like, oh my God, everyone's going to hate me for this. You know, I've definitely hoped that people could do something like this. Like, oh, can you please find a way to delineate between me and my own stupidity and shortcomings? (laughs) So in that sense, like it has something going for it. You know, there's, um, in fact, a famous Calvin and Hobbes cartoon strip. Uh, oh my gosh, I adore Calvin and Hobbes. So, so genius. Um, you can look it up if you, you know, Google it. Um, where the, this strip is the one where Calvin, the mischievous, you know, little boy is standing by the driveway when his dad comes home from work and, um, he's just, his, the father's just getting out of his car and Calvin has this completely freaked out look on his face and he's holding up a sign to his father <laughs> and the sign of course says, love the sinner hate the sin. <laughs> and I love the caption that comes from the, the mind of the dad. Like he doesn't say it out loud, just, you know, the little, the little mind clouds. And he, the dad is thinking, uh Oh, <laughs> like what did my son do this time? You know? So all that to say like this has, you know, it's something going for it. The way Richard Beck, um, summarized this. And, and by the way, I'll be drawing quite a bit from his work for this message. Um, his book unclean is fantastic on this topic. Um, But he points out that, you know, if you just divorce this from its actual historical usage um, and, you know, again, kind of imaginatively, you know, presume like, okay, I've never heard this. Well, it's got something going for it. He says, um, you know, it's a really good kind of a clever summation of the ideas of holiness and love. Right. So first you have this notion of love, love the sinner, love people. Agreed. All right. Second, hate the sin. Um, I know holiness has, is kind of a damaged word in its own right in Christian circles, but if you just think of it as hold to the good, don't do evil, <laughs> hold to the good. Oh, then my goodness, like who would disagree? Our world would be better off if we pursued the good and did not pursue evil. Um, so taken just in that way, 
it's it's clever, it's memorable, it's a it's a little aphorism on love and holiness. Okay, so far so good. However, <laughs> for all of its promise, love the sinner, hate the sin has not delivered the theological goods. It it has underperformed. Like Russell Wilson joined the Denver Broncos. Like the Dallas Cowboys breaking our hearts for all of my adult life. Lots of promise. <laughs> has not lived up to the hype. <laughs> In the same way, love the sinner, hate the sin. I mean, it was it was promising, it was clever, it was memorable. It just it's not lived up to the hype. In fact, quite the opposite. It has gone terribly wrong. I mean, some of these other statements we've been looking at, they just become kind of like cliche in ways and, you know, maybe not the best. This one's just gotten downright toxic. They just kind of, ugh, it's like brought out the worst in us. Um, why? Why? I think it's, it's those two key words, sinner and hate. Even though they're in separate sentences of the phrase, somehow... They burrow into our minds and merge in some sort of twisted union, eventually giving birth to certain emotional reactions and responses in us, uh, unhelpful ones. So let's, let's break this down a bit. Let's talk about this word, sinner. Sinner. You know who did not use the term sinner very often? Jesus. <laughs> He almost never. Um, You know who did? The Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, known much more for their stringent standards of holiness than their great love. They were, oh, they were digging this word. They use it all the time. Um, And yet it's interesting that you can, if you read the Gospels, you can find times where Jesus, he he did use the word. But um, it was never when he was preaching to the masses, right? So he never said something like, all right, all you sinners, Get your lives right. Uh, no. Um, in fact, every time Jesus uses the word, he's using it in conversation with people who themselves are using the, the word. Right? They use it, so then Jesus uses it. But then you'll notice he uses it differently. For example, um, one of the, the practices that was well known or that Jesus was well known for was table fellowship. This is described in Matthew 9, 13, um, Luke 5, 32, Mark 2, 17. It's like the same story playing out in different ways um, or described slightly differently. Um, So Jesus would eat with anyone, right? In our own very individualistic culture, we don't think much of this um, or not as much, though it does kind of still matter to us. But in Jesus' day, oh, it was a a much more communal culture, um, a much more porous view of the of the self and of bodies kind of reigned. So who you ate with, whose home you entered, who you allowed into your home, all a very big deal because sin was and in many ways still is seen as a contagion of sorts. Bodies are permeable. Feelings, desires, both good and bad, are, are kind of drift from one person to another. And, and who knows, maybe even the demonic might operate kind of in that way. And so you just want to be careful, you know, of getting too close. But it's interesting that Jesus did not live in fear of this. So while being a very holy man, he was simultaneously known as someone who would eat with anyone, would enter the home of anyone, prostitutes, tax collectors, sinners. So one day the Pharisees go to Jesus' disciples and ask them, why? Why does he do this? Why does he keep eating with with them, tax collectors, sinners? Verse 12 of Matthew 9 says this. On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So can you see in context, he uses the word, right? But but he's not preaching a sermon where he's saying, all right, all you sinners, get your life right. Clean up your act or else God's going to smite you. No, he, he uses the term, but he's, he uses the term that they use, but he uses it with compassion, with love. He, he uses it so differently. Another quick example. Um, this is from Luke 15. 
where the disciples um, ask actually about this kind of disaster that befell a group of, of people. There was um, a tower that was being constructed and apparently this terrible accident, it fell and crushed uh, some of the workers. So the disciples, I guess this was like you know, news in the area. So they ask Jesus, did this happen because they were such bad sinners? And he says, no, no, they were not worse sinners than anyone else. So again, he, he uses the term, um, but he uses it because they use it and he, he uses it differently. So all but to say, while the word sinner, it's, it's in the Bible, um, Jesus himself used it very rarely. And it's notably, he never used the phrase. He never said, love the sinner or love those sinners. And instead, do you know what his preferred term was? Neighbor. He said, love your neighbor. It was neighbor instead of sinner. In other words, see everyone around you, good and bad alike, as neighbors. By this, he didn't mean literally love the people to your left and right that live next to you. you know? he, he meant see everyone as people who you're close to, everyone as people to be loved. Now, this kind of begs the question, why? Why was this Jesus' preferred term instead of sinner? I mean, was it because, well, Jesus didn't really believe in sin and he thought we were all just perfect little angels? Uh, no, Jesus went to the cross. Um, he, he knows what humans are capable of. Um, and so I suspect it's because he knew the religious frame of mind. He knew that, as Richard Beck points out in his book, Unclean, um, that holiness and love pull in opposite directions. And it's really only by God's grace that we can merge the two. See, holy, I mean, remember the Pharisees, right? Holiness, purity, disgust, they, they end up pushing us to kind of long for strict boundaries. We long to separate ourselves from all things unclean, including unclean people. Right? And the, the unclean places that those people inhabit, whether it's, you know, the local bar or as some people imagine, or, you know, their house or, you know, whatever it is. But this is, this gets right to the heart of the problem with love the sinner, hate the sin. See, sinner is a term of identity. This is not a neighbor, just like me, who also struggles with sin. No, they're a sinner, morally unclean, dirty, right? Then you add that word sinner to the word hate, hate the sin, hate their sin, get worked up about their sin. And I mean, this is strong emotional language. And, and suddenly we've got this toxic combination going and notice where the focus has shifted to their sin, the things they're doing, those wicked people, those terrible people, what they're doing to, you know, it kind of can even get tribal. Like they're messing up our church. They're messing up our community. They're messing up our country, right? And you, you can just see where this goes haywire. You gotta, it begs the question though, why are we spending so much time and energy being incredibly upset over another's sin, I mean, this is where love the sin or hate the sin reeks of self-righteousness, reeks of us, the holy, are better than them, the unholy. And, you know, what happens? Well, this, this pharisaical impulse, this hatred and obsession with another sin, it eats our love alive. This hatred it, it chews up our compassion and spits it out. We, we start out trying to do both. Love people and hate their sin at the same time. <laughs> but what happens? We simply end up hating them. Because hatred and disgust, they're the opposite of love. Hatred and disgust distance us from others, sees them as other, sees them as dirty. But what does love do? It draws near. 
It pushes through societal boundaries and warnings of the need to stay morally withdrawn. Love draws near. The way uh, Rowan Williams, the um, church leader and theologian, put it, he said, failure is only healed by humility and solidarity, not by condemnation. In this light, you can think of sin and failure as, as a vulnerability of sorts. When, when people do wrong, like they already feel vulnerable. They already feel exposed. And so in that moment, our job, it's not to reveal and highlight their vulnerability through our judgment and condemnation. It's to show them compassion and mercy. There was an ancient uh, desert father and a uh, Ethiopian monk named Abba Moses. Uh, so this is not the Moses of Exodus, but he was, you know, took this Christian name and after that Moses, um, Father Moses. And in the writings of the time, he was extremely revered as a, a true, true saint. He, he lived in the, about the fourth century, I think. So, you know, hundreds, maybe three or 400 years after Christ or so. And a story about him has been passed down through the centuries. So, Apparently, there was a, a Christian brother uh, living in that area in the town of Skidus, and he committed some sort of significant sin. Um, we don't know the details, but um, it, was, it was significant enough that a, a council was called uh, of church leaders to which Abba Moses, you know, as this kind of revered saint, um, was invited. But he refused to go. So days passed. Um, no word from Abba Moses. Finally, on um, the priest finally sent someone to say to him on like the day of this this uh, kind of trial, um, sent someone to tell him, "Hey, please come. You know, everyone's waiting for you." So surprisingly, Abba Moses he got up and he went. However, he took a large jug of water, um, but it was leaking. And he carried it with him as he walked across the town. And when he um, got to the location of this trial, the, the leaders and other folks came out to meet him. But they saw this like trail of water behind him. And they said, uh, what are you doing? <laughs> what, what is this, father? <laughs> and the old man, um, Abba Moses, he, he said to them, my own sins run out behind me, and I do not even see them. And yet today, I am coming to judge the errors of another. The story goes that when they heard him say this, they said no more to the brother. Instead, they simply forgave him and sent him on his way. I think this is instructive because... The, the heart of Abba Moses here, it's so different than this obsession with the sins and shortcomings of others, love the sinner, hate the sin. So I wonder if maybe, maybe Jesus would call us to shorten the phrase. Um, perhaps we could shorten it to just love. That's it. Just, just that first word. <laughs> just love. I, I think honestly, that more than gives us something to work on. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.